The fear on the part of white people, I think, uh, the fear came in two parts. Uh, one is the fear of the unknown. And by that I mean they are comfortable with a system of segregation and are comfortable, comfortable with a system of white supremacy. And if that changes, they don't know what's going to be next. And that, that is really frightening to people, not to know what's going to replace what is in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, a stable system, the southern way of life, they call it. If that changes, what's going to replace it? And that, that's a real gamble, and most people are not willing to risk changing something that fundamental to their way of life. So that, in a general sense, I think we always have to keep in mind. They did not know what was going to be next. More specifically... Can I... Can I yes. And then we'll go back to the more specifically. I mean, this kind of fear as I understand it, goes back, I, I don't know how you pronounce Toussaint L'Overture, but the, the man who uh, rebe successfully rebelled against Napoleon, which was hard to do. Mm -hmm. It was an African-American rebellion in Haiti and they killed all the whites. And that became, throughout the early 19th century, that became a major fear down south, led to patrols and God knows what all, hardening of the attitudes towards slavery. But there seems always to have been this fear on the part of white people uh, of change and of what happens if uh, first if you, if you do away with slavery and later if you do away with Jim Crow. I think that's right. I was making a more general point though that I think it may be part of, if we have something called human nature, yeah, yeah. that we just fear the unknown. Yeah, yeah. But now when, you get, when, you, when race is involved, yes, it becomes all the more threatening to whites in the South, and particularly in places where there is a sizable or even a black majority, then there is just fear in numbers. More specifically, I think the fear was that somehow blacks would be uncontrolled, particularly black men, and that white women needed to be protected from black men. This fear of miscegenation, the fear that the white race would no longer be pure, uh, that, that just drove lots of people to do uh, what we now would see as kind of extreme things to protect segregation. And the, the, real, the real irony here is that uh, as someone, I think it's in the book, at least I've read that someone says, well, well what's the matter? Do you fear that your white daughter will, will not know how to deal with black men? Do you actually fear that she will be attracted to to black men. Yeah, yeah. So the fear is maybe that white women would, yeah. uh, would find them irresistible. Yeah, yeah. But it's always yeah. couched in terms of the threat that black men would, yeah. would pose. How about from the African-American standpoint? You make the, the point several times in a book, just like you make the point about the white fear of miscegenation. Mm -hmm. uh, you make the fear, uh, the point, and in fact it's very prominent at the very end of the book, that, uh, that uh, Black people lived in utter fear for their lives in the South for 90 uh, years or so. Well, for more than that, all through slavery. Uh, they had no way legally to protect themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the legal system was controlled by whites. So if uh, a lynch mob gathered, what could, what could blacks do? Yeah. The sheriff could be there and later would say, the, the lynching was conducted by persons and parties unknown. Yeah, yeah. And there would be people, they didn't have masks on, they were clearly visible, but nothing was ever done. So they had to live in fear. And not just fear of lynching, but fear of losing their jobs, fear of losing housing, all kinds of fears. One story I tell in the, in the book, for instance, a black employee at the university in the 1950s was summertime. All the students were virtually gone and they were working in a, a deserted dorm doing repairs and it was hot. And he decided that he would just go over and get a drink out of the water fountain. Well, his supervisor berated him, threatened to fire him because he drank out of a white water fountain. And blacks weren't supposed to do that. So there were these constant worries that they would somehow violate the line between the races and face some kind of retribution whether it be physical or economic, it, it, it didn't matter. It, it could be potentially very severe. Yeah.
This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.